Cheringham, Episode 26, Death on a Moonlit Night Written by Matthew Costello and Neil Richards Narrated by Neil Dudgeon Chapter One A Shot in the Dark Lee Taylor hit send on his weekly sales analysis email, listened for the satisfying whoosh, then shut down his laptop. He walked over to the glass wall and looked down onto the shop floor. From up here, face close to the glass, he could see not only the different departments, plumbing, lighting, tools, timber, kitchens, home furnishings, but also, and so much more important, his employees, his workers. Were they working? Working hard? That was the important question. What a stroke of genius from Hardwick, the company founder back in Texas all those years ago, to clothe the whole workforce in bright pink polo shirts. What colour could be more joyous, more inclusive, more fun than pink? Hardwick used to say to journalists, eager to discover the secret of the great chain store's success. But Lee knew the real reason. Had it on good authority from a senior exec on his last training course in the States. The real reason? Workers can't hide in a pink shirt. How brilliant that was! And how very true, even here in the English Cotswolds, thousands of miles away from Hardwick's flagship store in America. And even though it was nearly the end of the day shift, everybody tired, looking forward to the weekend, Lee could see if there was any slacking off, any lurking, any lazy chatting in dark corners. I'll have none of that, he thought. It helped that his office, way up here in the cavernous warehouse building, was visible from every one of those dark corners. Helped, too, that each and every one of those workers knew that if they didn't deliver 100% every minute of the damn working day, they would be docked pay. No arguments, no talking back, no disputes. No unions, of course, he thought, smiling to himself. I'm judge and jury. He ran his eye up and down the aisles, peering down the tall canyons of racks and shelves, looking for slackers. Three pink shirts restocking external doors and taking their time over it. In kitchens, the sales desk looked unmanned. And down in the paint section, that pink shirt hadn't moved for at least a minute. Dawdling. Not good. Lee made a mental note to check names and rotors, Then he did a quick headcount of customers in the aisles. Not bad, he thought. A perfect June evening outside, but still the lure of do-it-yourself worked its magic, drawing the locals in for cut-priced tools and home improvement. All assisted by helpful, smiling workers who might have felt like being anything other than helpful or smiling, but they knew they'd better, or else. His glance flicked across to the bank of CCTV monitors, Yes, the car park was filling up for the Friday evening rush. Weekend warriors, about to attack so many summary projects. Result. That email, his 52nd weekly analysis for head office since he'd taken over the Cheringham store, told the story of his success in clear, stark figures that the regional director couldn't ignore. Overheads, mostly staff costs, down 10%. Sales up. 10% in just 12 months, he thought. Bloody genius that I am. Even I didn't expect that. Another year here and he'd be sure to get Swindon or Gloucester. Or maybe even one of the big Birmingham stores. Who knows? London? He grinned. 
then a voice behind him. Mr. Taylor? He swivelled to see Nick Marston at the door. Nick? He waited, watched his young assistant manager blinking at him. He nodded to Nick to enter. Got the report on Bailey, said Nick, holding up a file of papers. And? Don't you want to read it? said Nick, offering the report. I trust you, Nick. It's why I made you my number two. Just tell me what it says. Oh, uh, right, OK. Well, it's pretty clear he started it. Apparently he was mouthing off in the pub at lunchtime, had a few too many, said he was going to come back and have a go at me. Hmm. Uh, uh, yes. Anyway, seems like he got into a scrap with one of the part-timers and so, drinking, fighting on the premises, and we have witnesses, yes? Yes. Fair enough, and more than enough. Where is he now? Cooling off in the staff room. Lee checked his watch. He really didn't need this. He wanted to get home, watch the match, have a couple of single malts. And anyway, it was time Marston did some of the dirty work round here. After all, that's why he'd promoted him. Nick, I haven't got time for this now, he said. You deal with it. Go down there, hand him his notice. I'm not having that kind of behaviour in my store. He could see Nick taken aback at what he was being asked to do. Really? he said. A oh, bit of trouble, yes, but Bailey's been here since the place opened. All the more reason to get rid of him, said Lee. Clear out the dead wood. Oh, but Mr Taylor, he's very popular with the rest of the staff and the customers, do you know, and um, we've already lost so many good people. Lost, Nick, said Lee, smiling. This isn't about who likes who, who's good, who's funny, who's popular. We're a business with a bottom line. You do get that, hmm? Nick nodded, looking uneasy. You're the assistant manager. Do it. Lee knew he didn't have to add, or else. He guessed that Nick was smart enough to know that he was dispensable too. Anything else? he said. Nick shook his head. Good, said Lee, smile back on his face. I'll see you on Monday. He waited while Nick seemed to think this through, then finally, when he'd turned to go, Don't forget, Nick, this is your store tomorrow and Sunday. He watched Nick turn round again, run his hand through his hair nervously. I expect to see some really good numbers come Monday morning, and I don't want any bullshit excuses like last week. He saw Nick step forward. Uh, wait a second, that, that's really not fair, Mr Taylor. You know we had staff problems, no one in plumbing for hours. That wasn't my fault. Whoa! Nick, cool it, huh? We're done arguing about that, OK? Just make up for it this weekend, you hear? He stared at Nick, eyes locked on his, daring Nick to come back at him. You got something else you want to say to me? But Nick's shoulders drooped and he looked away. No, Mr Taylor. Now Lee stepped closer, smiled. Good, said Lee. And remember... First name terms, that's the Hardwick way, one big happy family. Yes, Lee, said Nick, blinking again. Lee edged even closer, close enough he knew to make Nick uncomfortable, then patted him gently on the shoulder, smiled at him. Good man, off you go then. He watched Nick turn and walk out, then he shook his head. The guy was so easy to manipulate, too easy. He picked up his car keys and briefcase from his desk and left the office thinking, I need to move on, need a challenge. This stupid place isn't big enough for me. Lee pushed the remnants of his takeaway to one side, took a swig from his glass of scotch and put his feet up on the coffee table. One bonus from Melissa walking out on me, he thought. I get to watch the footy and have a curry any time I like. And he could leave the washing up the whole weekend and nobody would moan at him. Toilet seat up, down, who the hell cared? Best of all, because she did the walking, that divorce settlement should go nicely his way. Of course, there were some disadvantages to her surprise departure, but nothing that a nice relaxing massage in the Thai place in Swindon couldn't cure. He leaned back in the sofa, picked up the TV remote and channel hopped. The game, boring, 2-0 up with ten minutes to go and it didn't look like anybody wanted to score that much. Maybe catch a movie instead? God, it was hot tonight, even in a T-shirt and his old shorts. Quick dip in the pool might be nice. Then he heard a car coming down the gravel drive. 
He looked up at the open window just as the outside security light flicked on. He sat up and could see a car pulling up on the other side of his Audi. He peered through the big sitting room window out into the garden trying to see who it was. Well, from the shape of the car, an older model Ford, it looked like his mystery visitor was Nick Marston. Problems? He shook his head. If it's more trouble up at the store, I'm going to kick his ass all the way back there to deal with it himself, he thought. What's the point of having a dog that doesn't bark? He walked out into the hall, then slipped his boots on, opened the door and called out, Nick, what the hell? The security light flicked off. Now the circular drive was in darkness, just the light from the moon making shapes in the bushes. Best change the timer on that light goes off too fast. Now in the dark. Nick, is that you? He stepped out onto the drive, his boots uncomfortable with no socks, and walked over to the car. With this movement, the light came back on. Oh, yes, Nick's car, all right, and the idiot had parked right up on the grass. Well, don't just bloody sit there, he said, walking up to the side of the car. Then he stopped. The car looked empty, but that wasn't possible. He hadn't heard a door open or close. What was going on? We playing games, then, he called into the garden. Because I'm not into bloody hide-and-seek, mate. He waited, then... You been drinking? No response, the whole garden quiet. And out here, a mile or so from the village, quiet meant quiet. Not a sound. And suddenly Lee felt uncertain. This was weird. The security light went out, so he turned and walked back towards the house. No light. He waved an arm, but still the light didn't come back on again. Funny, why is the motion tracker not working? And then the lights in the house went out. All of them. Darkness again. He stopped dead, standing on the gravel, his eyes still not adjusting. Moonlight making flickering shapes on the lawn. OK, what the hell's going on? Nick, what are you playing at? This was not good, screwing around like this, drink or no drink. Nobody did this to him and got away with it. This wasn't a joke. He stepped carefully in the darkness towards the house, now framed against the moonlit sky, then saw a shape just a couple of yards away, in the doorway. The doorway of his house. What the hell are you playing at? said Lee, walking fast towards the shape, his fist already ready to strike, when he caught a glimpse of a stick held tight. No, not a stick. A gun. He grabbed at it, his other hand trying to push away the intruder, but his foot slipped on the loose gravel and he turned, twisting, falling, losing his balance. An impossible light and sound and flash of energy exploded in his face and then pain, a terrible, intense pain, arced across his stomach and chest and face. He felt himself falling backwards in slow motion, his head tilting, and as he fell and the back of his head hit the sharp gravel, the last thing he knew for sure was... God, someone just shot me. And then he didn't think any more.